this election loss has affected us all. We have incredible MLAs that didn't get to return to their seats in the legislature. Strong candidates that didn't get to have a chance to represent their communities in the House. And we lost that precious gift of being able to govern on behalf of the people of this province. But how we respond to this loss is really important. And it's what's going to define us as a party and determine how we move forward. And we certainly do have a choice to make, I think. We can wallow and point fingers at each other and assign blame. Or we can wrap our arms around each other, recognize what we did wrong, recognize the mistakes, learn from them, and do better next time. And if we're not focused as a party on these issues that matter to people, that keep them up at night, that are affecting their daily lives and livelihoods, we're not just feeling it being an opposition party. We're going to be an opposition party for a long time. But we have to get our own house in order. There's no question. We have to rebuild our 55 riding associations one by one so that all of them are competitive. We have to re-energize our party members and engage them in a meaningful conversation about what we're going to stand for now, what our purpose is, what we want to deliver to Nova Scotians. Because it can't just be about beating Tim Houston. It has to be about inspiring people and offering them a viable alternative, improving their lives and setting the stage for future success of our province. I've been in cabinet where we've made some of the big decisions. And it hasn't been easy. I'll tell you that. But I've been in the trenches with this party for 12 years because this has been my calling. And I feel called now to lead because I think we can be the force that we were before. I think we can win the next election and I think we can have a positive impact on the lives of people and on the direction of this province. But folks, we need to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. The time for a look at our wounds needs to be over. The time for getting to work and doing what's necessary to be competitive and to win again is here. I want to tell you I'm ready for this challenge. I know our team is that's elected. I know you are, and I join you. I ask you to join me so we can make it happen. Thank you all so much. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. We've just listened to the official announcement that Zach Churchill, Yarmouth MLA, was going to run for the Nova Scotia Liberal Party leadership. And Zach is our guest. Welcome back to our podcast. Listen, guys, thanks for having me on again. Love being on with you. You know, it's the first chance we've had to uh, chat with you on the podcast, at least, since your uh, your leadership uh, victory. And uh, so much congratulations. Now, when Stephen McNeil stepped down as leader, there were some rumors that you might uh, take a stab at that, uh, but you didn't. Uh, so what was different this time when uh, Ian Rankin stepped away? Well, I, I did regret making that decision uh, last time around. Uh, you know, the reasons I did, I was really worried about the, the impacts to the family. I had just watched Stephen be isolated in Halifax, if you remember, during the COVID lockdowns for months at a time away from his family. And, you know, at the time that really created some, some stress in my life. Right. I was like, Oh God, you know, I, I, I can't, I certainly can't be away from uh, Katie and, and the girls for months at a time. That wouldn't be fair to her. And it would be uh, absolute torture. And I mean, a lot of pressure. I was education minister at the time. So we were getting our kids back to school, working on that plan and um, didn't feel like the timing was right. Just had uh, a lot of pressure on and, uh, you know, was was really worried about about the impacts uh, on on the on the family life and, and dynamic. So things are different. You know, we didn't go into those lockdowns again, where you know the premier wasn't able to see anybody. And um, there's something exciting about opposition. It's not as it's not as satisfying the work on the day to day, but you actually get to build your own plan and your own vision for what you want to do if you get back into to government. So. The idea of taking over at this time, working on the rebuilding of the party and getting us ready for the next election from an idea perspective, from an organizational perspective, um, is pretty pretty exciting work to, to dig into. 
And I knew I had some regrets after not doing it last time. So I had uh, I committed last time that if, if the opportunity arose that I, I, I would miss it. And, uh, and here we are, I caught the bus. So <laughs> now it's, now it's like, you know, now it's, uh, now it's, a, it's a lot more work and uh, a lot more pressure, but, um, I'm really excited to be the first one from Yarmouth, I believe to lead, uh, lead any political party, uh, you know, at least in the, the modern era. Your wife and family, Zach, have always supported you. A big shout out to your mom, Joanne, who's I know one of your biggest fans and uh, and helpers as well. You know how important is that uh, whole family uh, uh, support system when it comes to fo- politics? It's it's well for me it's totally necessary. You know I've got an incredible uh, partner in in Katie who is just there. When I'm at my best, when I'm at my worst, when I'm feeling excited, when I'm feeling anxious or stressed out, and she's just a constant source of support and, and therapy for me. Uh, and the girls are awesome. You know, Cecilia and Eva are just uh, so much fun. Uh, they are noticing when I'm away more now. They're five and three, and uh, that's that is tough. You know, I got like the. I, I think it was actually last week. Cecilia, the oldest, said, "You know, Daddy, where are you? I miss you. I'd been away for about a week at that point." And, uh, it crushed me, you know, but you do have to make sacrifices, you know, not just in for a career in politics, but you know, in a lot of careers and, you know, you make those sacrifices for the ability to have an impact and represent your community and, and hopefully, you know, make a difference in the, in the right areas, uh, for people. And, uh, they're really good at getting on the road with me too, if I need to travel, uh, when they're available to, and, um, that, that part of the dynamic is, is really, uh, really great. And I know no matter what happens in politics, I get to come home to a really, um, incredible partner and, and fun and loving family. And my, my mom, of course, I'm her only son. So, um, you know, she has been obsessed with me my whole life. <laughs> You're her favorite, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm her, fa- I'm her favorite, <laughs> favorite boy. Yeah. Uh, but of course she's just, you know, does, does everything from helping out with the kids to, I, I, I drove by one day, you know, one of the campaigns and her and my aunties were banging in signs <laughs> on people's lawns, right? I'm like, what am I doing to these people? Uh, but no, and then, then the extended family, of course, we're, we're, you know, really close on, on my mother's side, on the, the Bashara side of the family. And I get a lot of support from the Churchill side as well. Um, but the Bashara side has always just been kind of a very close uh, family dynamic and there's just a, yeah, a lot of love and support, uh, for us. So very fortunate in, in that regard. And that's, uh, it provides great fuel, you know, for you, it gives you energy and, and gives you a great comfort when you need that as well. A leadership campaign is a lot different than a, uh, uh, general election campaign. I mean, your hustings is essentially the entire province, uh, that you've got to travel in a certain amount of time that had to be exhausting, yeah, it can be tiring for sure. You've got to travel around the province, um, talk to a lot of people. I, honestly, the traveling is, is is kind of less tiring than the, than the phone calls. Like you're basically on the phone from, you know, uh, you know, nine nine thirty in the morning. That's I don't feel comfortable calling people before then um, till you know nine nine at night. So you got to talk to a lot of people. You've got to get around and see a lot of places, and you've really got to rely on uh, your organization and the people you have working for you and and volunteering for you. So it was, it was actually a lot of fun. It was a six month campaign. I've never done one that long. And, uh, but I got to see a really lot of, uh, cool communities in the province. Some of which I I hadn't had a chance to see, uh, meet, you meet a lot of people. You have a lot of great engaging conversations. Uh, The other, the other big difference is between this and the general is you're dealing with, liberal party members or people that are, you know, liberal minded at least. So it is, uh, you're less likely to encounter, you know, hostility or, uh, uh, you know, anger, anger towards you. And not that you don't encounter some of that, but you are kind of preaching to the choir in a, uh, you know, from a certain perspective on that. And that's fun. So, you know, I had a lot of great, great chats with people, met a lot of people, uh, made some new friends got to see a lot of exciting things in the province and uh it was really fun particularly when Katie and the kids were on the road with me and you know we got to make a make it a family affair as well so Zach who's who set the six month timeline is that a liberal party thing is that an election Canada thing how did that work 
that's a that's a party decision. So the structure of the of the party for our party, anyways, there's a president and a board of directors, and it's the the board of directors that would actually make those decisions. They they kind of run the corporation of the of the party, or they'd be the corporate board of the party, and the leader of the party would, now is myself. We're, we're, we kind of lead caucus and the and the and and you know manage the resources that we have in our in our caucus office. So there is a a difference of uh, authority there, I guess. And so it would be the party board that makes those decisions. So was six months normal? To be honest, I really hadn't paid attention to the length of it. Cause I mean, when you call an election, it's a real snap and you're done, right? Well, yeah, general elections are 30 days. So this was a six month one. It does, it, it, you know, it, it does tend to be the case when you look at uh, party leadership races, you know, the federal conservative one just finished up the summer. I think that was um, over six months, it might have been longer. So that, that that does tend to be kind of in the range of of the leadership races. But it feels it's long though, <laughs> you know. Like it yeah, feels, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it feels long. So it, like relatively, it, it, I guess it's not long when you look at the fact that that's what usually happens. But certainly when you're in it, it feels like a long time. But it's also you can pace yourself a little more. So in a thirty day campaign, there's really you know nothing else that you're focused on. You're banging on doors from morning to night calling people it's a sprint this one was more of a marathon so there there is a difference in terms of how you manage your time and uh and how you pace yourself as well there's a different arc to to the campaign where if you you know you you expense all your resources or or energy at the beginning of it and you can leave yourself in trouble at the end uh so it's 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 a totally different not totally different but there's there there are some big differences between running that sort of campaign and, uh, you know, a general election, which I would have been used to just really focusing on the local area in Yarmouth and trying to get to every door that I can in, in 30 days. Just the logistics alone in organizing a leadership campaign like that, you know, province wide, um, you know, you need to concentrate while you're campaigning on, on your messaging and, and meeting with the various, uh, local liberal organizations. So I, want to ask you about the volunteers. Obviously, um, most of these people are very experienced. I can think of a few names off the top of my head. <laughs> and so how do they work, you know, with you and connect with the other liberal uh, associations uh, to get your, you know, your travel schedule and, and all of that? It, it's, it's, it's run by primarily volunteers. There are some folks that we had to pay just because of the hours they were putting in or the you know, expenses they were uh, incurring themselves. Um, but yeah, you really just have to rely on mostly a broad base uh, network of friends and volunteers, um, family members who are going to sign people up for the party in support of you. And you really have to pay attention to the math, of course, where your points are, where you need to get points. And uh, that kind of drives the uh, the strategy. So, you know, I was really fortunate to work with a, a, a big group of people who I get along with really well. There's a lot of trust and uh, we had a lot of fun on the campaign as well. And th- that's really key to, I think, running successful campaigns is just doing it with people that you care about and that care about you and that you get along with and can have fun with and, and where there's a real joint sense of purpose, you know, it's, it's not just about the person you're trying to get in. It's about what you want to achieve on the other end of it, what you want to do. So you, you, you know, you, you try to bring people in that share your philosophy and that like your ideas and, and also people that will challenge your ideas and, uh, and your thinking as well. Cause that's how you get to the, you know, I think the, uh, the best outcomes really when there's not everyone's just saying yes to you ever, you know, you have people that are, you trust and you know, they're going to give you the straight goods, whether it's your, your, your ideas or campaign strategy, um, how you're communicating, all that sort of stuff. So we had a really good group and it, I really actually enjoyed the experience quite a bit, a lot more than I thought I would. There are some similarities between a leadership campaign and a and general election. I mean, when you're in a general election, you're, meeting with uh, constituents, uh, hearing their concerns. Does that uh, apply also to when you're meeting with the various liberal uh, associations during your leadership campaign? Or is there a little difference there, Zach? Well, I mean, it's it's the same in that 
everyone's going to have their issues. So the issues are a bit different, right? When you're running in a leadership campaign, the issues that people have are primarily around, you know, the party. Okay, this is what we like about the party. This is what we don't like. Um, and that can be, you know, uh, thoughts around organization to fundraising, where we're spending our resources to how we're, you know, communicating as a party with members or or with the public. So, yeah, people people have issues. You have to listen to them, uh, hear them out, and really incorporate the the good thoughts that people have and and the and the good criticisms into your your thinking and how you're going to deal with these issues that people are are, are addressing with you. And I mean that's that 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 is very similar to a general election, although the issues just might be a bit a bit different. So what sort of changes have you made, Zach, in your, I guess, your approach or whichever in in defining your own leadership style? Like, what would you kind of, where would you put yourself? Well, my, my, my nature is to be facilitative in, in the way that I, that I lead uh, primarily. So really working to ensure that the, the, that I'm, I'm working well in our caucus is working well with the party board and, and the party president, uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Doucette's a great, uh, great guy. I've, I'm lucky that I've had a long-standing relationship with him. So, you know, we're just working on bringing the different elements of the party uh, together, working um, better together, and uh, making sure that we're growing our organization in each and every uh, constituency across the province, and that we have a really good process in place to develop our platform next time, where we bring in the party membership, uh, where we bring in um, top thinkers on, on the subjects that we, we do have to deal with as a province, you know, healthcare is, is among the top of those, but you have to figure out, okay, the economy is shifting quite a bit here. The labor market's changing a lot. Um, climate change is obviously going to have a whole host of impacts on everything from our, our infrastructure to, uh, our coastlines, um, to, to our, our economy and society itself. So, you know, how do we wrap our heads around what needs to happen and what interventions, what role can government play to make sure we're uh, doing better and more resilient as a province and, and a people and that uh, people aren't, aren't falling behind in these, these changing times. So certainly you've got the day-to-day business of opposition and, and trying to help run the province as a whole, but uh, internally within the party, of course, you know, within the last election, um, you got relegated to opposition. So have you had a chance to really kind of digest and dissect what happened and then how you're going to fix that for next time around? Totally. And there was uh, two individuals that actually penned a report and it's it's been made available to the public, uh, kind of going through the challenges that we had the last election where you know, we weren't um, executing from an organizational standpoint or communication standpoint. You know, they basically, you know, penned a report on on what went wrong and how we can improve how we operate for the next time. So uh, some of those changes have already um, been, uh, have started to be implemented within the party. How we're working together, um, you know, refocusing us on local organization building because that's absolutely key. You know, we lost, there was only 10, there was only a shift of 10,000 votes last election. It's funny how the numbers kind of add up, right? Well, that's an issue with the first pass the post system is a very small group of people. uh, If they, if those votes land in the right seats can change one majority government to another. So it's, you know, it, it, it is quite something. So I, th- I think there was around, uh, it, this is on elections in Nova Scotia, so uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, th- I believe it was around 10,000 10, votes, 10,000, 12,000 votes, something like that, that went that moved us from a uh, liberal majority to a Tory majority. So that's not a big shift in votes. And and when it comes down to it, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of seats. We, you know, one we lost, I think, by around 80 votes. And others we lost, you know, between 100 and, and 300 votes. And and when you're looking at numbers like that, that's 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 organizing at the local level can really make the difference on those sorts of numbers. Identifying who your votes are and, and getting them out to vote. Um, and we managed to in Yarmouth. We were I've been very lucky to have a very uh, strong and energized local organization that's good at fundraising, that's good at campaigning, 
um, and preparing for campaigns and being smart about how we campaign. And, you know, if we managed to hold uh, the highest, uh, the highest percentage of any liberal in the province, which I was, it, it, the, the election night, it didn't feel that good. But when I look back and look at the tide shifting in rural Nova Scotia against us, particularly on, on, on healthcare, the healthcare issue, uh, and me being a sitting uh, health minister in, in, you know, uh, a rural area, uh, the fact that we were able to hold the highest um, amount uh, of votes amongst liberals, uh, I was quite pleased with. And I have to give credit to my campaign team uh, locally for that. And I'm very appreciative of the community members that, you know, stuck with me. Uh, through that, even when the even when the tide was turning uh, against the government. So anyway, you want to replicate? Uh, I like to replicate the success we've had here in Yarmouth from an organizational perspective uh, across the board, in in every every constituency in the province, because that's can really make the difference, you know, in in uh, winning government, not winning government, and, and having people you think are going to be exceptional MLAs uh, getting in or not. So. So do you think, from a change perspective, are you looking more towards? organizational changes or foundational changes or a combination of the two? Uh, well, I, th- I think we've, we've got to do both. So we've, we've got to be better organized. We've got to do better at, at fundraising. I mean, if, if you can't do those two things, it's, it's, you can't win elections. Um, but uh, even more importantly is the ideas that you have and that you're running on, uh, I believe. So that I, I think is foundational. And I think we're, really facing some significant changes in our environment, our economy, our society, in the way that healthcare can and, and will be delivered. And we've really got to wrap our heads around these things or uh, what's going to happen or there's probably going to be people that fall behind um, under these circumstances. You know, just look at the, ec- the economic difference between now and when I started in politics, you know, 12 years ago, uh, even just looking the Yar- the Yarmouth example, you know, people couldn't sell their homes. Um, we had uh, a higher unemployment rate, and people couldn't find jobs. You look twelve years later, people people can't buy homes uh, either because they're too expensive or the supplies an issue, uh, or find places to to rent. The unemployment is low, but there's a labor shortage now. So uh, employers can't find employees. So it's like the whole thing has has shifted. It's changed. It's, it's the opposite of what it was 12 years ago. And we don't know, you know, whether we don't we don't exactly know what's going to happen over the next 10 years. So you, you have to do your best to kind of wrap your head around these issues and figure out, OK, we're what government what role does government have here? Um, and how do we make sure that uh, we're a resilient province, that uh, people are, are protected, and that we can, you know, get stronger uh, through this this period uh, of change? You look at how healthcare, the system, you know, the situation with our healthcare system. We've it's 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 gotten almost twice as bad in the last year since the election, and that's not just because of the election. Although I do think this the current government, the Houston government, has made decisions that have exacerbated the problems in healthcare, um, like in a big way. Um, but the nature of family practice is changing. Less docs are getting into family medicine. Uh, the ones that are practiced very differently than, than the ones from the previous generation. This creates access issues to primary care, uh, which means uh, our emergency rooms are going to be overburdened with non-urgent issues, people just trying to get their prescriptions renewed or get their blood work ordered, these sorts of things. Um, and we have a labor shortage that is not just impacting private businesses, uh, but is impacting government services as well, like even in education. When I, when I started, you know, substitute teachers couldn't find full-time work. Now we have a substitute shortage, you know, and, and this is, of course, impacting uh, government services and, and and business and the and the economy as well. Uh, and so, you know, what 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 can government do about this? Um, where do we focus our our finite resources and our energy? And what policies make sense uh, in light of all these big changes? You know, and, and where's where's this thing going over the next ten years? And how do we make sure that we're going to be be okay or or be in a better position? Right. So that stuff's fun. 
you know, wrapping your head around big problems, like that's the most satisfying part of the work for me uh, outside of, you know, being being in a close-knit community and representing them and, and supporting people on their local issues. But if you deal with these big issues, it helps a whole bunch of people. You know, that's that's the difference, you know. It's very satisfying to help somebody with a case file, help them get a grant for their their oil tank or, you know, deal with whatever particular issue they're dealing with. But when you can bring a law in or a government program in or restructure a government department, you know, those things can have uh, major consequences for, for the lives of, of a lot of people, right? So um, that, stuff's, uh, that stuff's really motivating for me. That's the whole, one of the major reasons I really love this line of work. Let's talk about some of the issues, Zach. First of all, uh, both the Premier and the Public Works Minister, Kim Maisland, uh, caused quite a stir recently when they said that the government is going to be reviewing the Nova Scotia to Maine ferry services. You know, okay. But then the Premier said they were concerned about the numbers. And then... Minister Maislin went as far as to say that the discontinuation of that ferry service was, and I quote here, absolutely a possibility. You know, did you ever think, Zach, that that we'd be back in this situation um, uh, that we were with Premier Dexter and the NDP back in 2009 when the provincial support was withdrawn and we lost the ferry? When I watched the the Tories move from being a pro-ferry party, the party that actually brought Bay Ferries to Yarmouth, um, signed the first deal with them. Uh, when I watched them move, it started under um, under Bailey, and then and then Houston really, uh, you know, really really dug in on it. You know, as as far as suing Bay Ferries, taking them to court. Um, I have always been worried about this, and this is something that I have communicated with the community here in the tourism sector across the province and and other communities. And they've done a very good job politicizing this ferry service, the Conservatives have, and uh, and really beating beating it up in every other community, right? And it, it's easy to do that when you're saying, "Oh, look at what Yarm is getting. Look at this expensive ferry service." But when you when you pull your perspective back, look at all the ferries in Nova Scotia. Consider the fact that we are, uh, you know, a peninsular we're surrounded by water. Uh, everywhere but the the Chignecto Isthmus, which connects us to New Brunswick, you know, and we have a whole pile of ferries here, all of which are either completely funded by the government um, or heavily subsidized. It's like, what's the problem with this ferry? This is actually one of the the best economic generators out of out of any of them. You know, let's look at the numbers for this this season. This is year one coming out of COVID. The market's down for Americans coming into, and this is the first year in Bar Harbor. So the market is down 20% compared to pre-COVID in Portland. Um, the ferry market of U.S. travelers going into B.C. and other parts of the province is down 78%. So we've only dropped 20%, while the rest of the country has dropped 78%. You don't have other governments saying, we're going to get rid of these ferries. Uh, we have government paid for bridges that connect Ontario, Windsor, Ontario, to the United States travel by car across land or bridge from the U.S. into Canada is down 40%. So if you actually look at the numbers of this ferry, it is the recovery is outpacing the rest of the country. Um, you look at the, the, the dollar spent here even this summer, so about 30,000 of the 40,000 passengers this summer are Americans coming here. Um, we know they spend about, I think, uh, $2,500, $2,600 a party of two, you know, the average party is a party of two. That means the, the financial spend from that, that vessel, uh, into our province, uh, was, was between 35 and $40 million this summer, right. In a, in a recovery, in a recovery year, the vessel costs us, you know, 13 a year to subsidize. It's, it's very similar to the Digby subsidy, the, the Picto ferry subsidy that goes to PEI, you know, we're connected the PEI by the Confederation Bridge, paid for by the government as well, um, and we still have a provincially and federally subsidized ferry service going to PEI. The, the, the ferry in Newfoundland, going to Newfoundland from Cape Breton, costs about 130, 150 million a year to operate, all taxpayer money. 
They're looking at putting a new ferry in Bedford to bring people downtown in Halifax. It's about $170 million to get that one going, right? So you actually look at the numbers when you pull your perspective out and don't just look and target the ferry we have here in Yarmouth. You're like, okay, this actually is a very good deal. And there's a big return to the province uh, with the service and the fact that it's American dollars coming here, new money into our economy. Um, there's probably not a, a, a bigger economic driver in our province if, you, if you're just looking at marine transit, if you're looking at ferries, right? So it's frustrating. It's disheartening. Uh, I do feel it's like um, it's, it's, it's because it's down here in Yarmouth and, and people for some reason have a, have a problem with, with taxpayer money coming down here, even though we pay more than our fair share of taxes. There's a, a ton of wealth down here that's heavily taxed from the lobster industry, um, from tourism as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it drives me, it drives me absolutely <laughs> crazy. And, and it, it would just, it would just crush me if we lost this service again, because so much work and resources and, and money have gone into reestablishing it. And we are seeing the economic, uh, payoff, even in a recovery year coming out of COVID like this. Right. So I just, I hope, uh, common sense and the math, uh, prevail and that the politics around the ferry, um calms down right because it's it's very unfair and it it seems we we treat this service different than uh you know the dozens of other ferry services that we have in the province that are all um you know not all of them but but many of which are are are, are very important to our economy uh, as well right so it's uh yeah i'm very fearful of that any sense Zach, of why this seems to be such a political thing well, this, it became political when the NDP cut the service. So, you know, it becomes political on the pro-ferry side at that point. So, you know, one of the reasons I got elected down here was over that ferry issue. And uh, since then, it, it has been political. So we get it back. Then, of course, the politics flares up on the other side. Oh, it's a waste of money. It's a boondog. We start seeing the, the conservatives using words like this um and promoting antagonism towards it uh, all over the province um and uh that's continued so it, it's been pulled it, ever since it was cut no one was really paying attention to it before you know it wasn't a political issue we've had it we've had ferries in the arm with harbor going to the u.s for what, 200 years or something or 150 years uh and uh and the cutting it was was a political decision and of course that brought it into the political realm and we haven't been able to get it out there. So we really need to depoliticize this, right? Um, it's, it's people need to understand this is part of a broad based ferry network, all of which is heavily subsidized or paid for fully uh, by government. The government pays for these things because they're what are called loss leaders. You know, you, you, you don't make money on the service itself, but they generate positive economic uh, activity and bring new wealth into the province uh, or, just help people uh, travel as well. In some cases, you know, there's a lot of ferries in the province that don't make any money. They don't, they don't really generate any economic activity, but they help people get over a river. Um, like the English town ferry in Cape Breton or help connect people to their homes that are on islands, you know, like a uh, long Island or Briar Island or, or Tancook Island. So people need to look at the ferry services in Nova Scotia as extensions of our highways. Um, and uh, this one in particular is very important. Uh, for tourism and for new money being brought into the province. And 60% of people's time that come in through that boat into Yarmouth is not spent in Yarmouth. It's spent, it's spent elsewhere uh, in the province. So out of that close to $40 million spend this summer that people would have had, uh, 60% of that money is not spent in Yarmouth. It's spent elsewhere. It's spent along, spent along the South Shore of the Valley, Halifax, Cape Breton, right? It, it's, uh, it's not just Yarmouth's ferry. It is, it is Nova Scotia's international ferry link. And, and most of the economic impact, uh, or at least the dollar, the, the economic impact is, 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 is important here because uh, we do get a, a direct benefit from, from it. But the economic spend, 60% of it, is, is not even in this community. It's elsewhere. So um, that's another thing people need to recognize, too. It, it impacts a whole lot more communities than your own. It impacts the whole province. Couple of questions, Zach. First of all, do you think Premier Houston is uh, using this whole ferry file as a perhaps a distraction from some of the issues that maybe he's 
not taken care of as he should have. And secondly, Zach, do you think this is a little personal for him? You know, you were front and center on this uh, of this fairy file. Now you're, um, you know, leader of the Nova Scotia Liberal Party. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you could be right on all those fronts. Um, it's a distraction, certainly from the state of health care. You know, there's twice as many people without a family doctor than there was uh, this time last year. The emergency rooms are closing more. The labor shortage is worse. Basically, everything you look at in healthcare in healthcare right now is worse than it was a year ago by by a pretty substantial margin. Um, they also know. I mean, I do I do wonder if it's just kind of strategy to either get me off my game or, or pull my mind uh, elsewhere um, because it does really matter to me. I really care about it. I know how important it is for my community, but also for the province. So certainly, you know, I, I do think of that. Uh, I do think about that. But I mean, my intention is to try to depoliticize this um, as best I can, allow the tourism operators and uh, other community leaders to to take the charge on this uh, file, if, if that can work, because um, I, I do. I just think that we need to depoliticize this. It's it's not a political issue. It you know, it's like zero point zero zero one percent of the budget. Um, if you look at the economics of it, it's, it's an obvious, a very obvious good investment. So I just, I hope the kind of economic side of the argument, the numbers speak for themselves and that the tourism sector is able to kind of, uh, promote that with the government. Cause they are going to care more about what those folks are saying, uh, than what I'm saying on it. You know, my, my position on it's been pretty clear over the years. Um, and, uh, I certainly won't stop defending it or, or speaking about, the economic impact and the rationale for it. Um, but I, I uh, also can't lose focus of the other big issues that are affecting um, the province, like, you know, healthcare, housing, uh, inflation and affordability issues that are impacting you know, so many, so many Nova Scotians, particularly those on, on, on fixed incomes or, or working low wage work. And, you know, you just got to kind of take in to consideration, uh, uh, all those bigger issues as well, and, and try not to let this this uh, distract us. I certainly hope they don't get rid of it. You know, we do have a cabinet minister in Argyle, uh, Colton, who who you know I know supports the ferry, and uh, um, just like his predecessor, I think is in a very tricky position because of of Houston's positioning on it. It's it's it's, it's I'm sure it's it's been no fun for any conservative in this part of the province. Um, but you got to kind of lean on the champions within the, within their party too, to hopefully, um, ensure that, uh, that reason and, and good sense, uh, win the day. So Houston campaigned on a, we're going to fix healthcare platform, um, which I, I mean, I realize that healthcare or the issues in healthcare is a cumulative effect. It's not something that's just magically appeared. It's something that's that's been brewing for a long while. Do you think we're at the point where we're 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 not at a at a a juncture where fix one thing and it'll cascade and help stabilize the whole thing? It, do you feel that maybe it's it, we're at the worst part, or is there still more to come? I, I mean, I certainly hope it doesn't get worse than this because the system's on the on the verge of collapsing. Um, I don't see it getting better soon, and um, I do think they've made decisions that ha- that have made it worse. Uh, you know, they're like one one thing I'm observing is basically, and they just fired a bunch of all the directors in housing. Uh, I think this was a, this was announced today or yesterday. Um, they have fired a lot of deputy. Uh, ministers, they've gotten rid of independent boards for crown corporations. Um, they fired a very seasoned healthcare board for the health authority with some some of the country's leading healthcare administrators, like Doc, Dr. Brennan Carr, who was uh, who ran the BC system, and we heavily recruited him to come out here. And he, they did such a good job holding the system through COVID and making you know, incremental changes that are going to help us get to where we, where we need to be. Uh, but, but keeping the system intact, they, they fired all these people to put in partisans and, and in the premier's own words, kind of personal friends. Um, so that's a problem, right? If you're, if you're not listening to the experts, if you're not listening to the, uh, 
the administrative leads who are from the medical community, you can be more prone to make mistakes or to politicize decision making and, and make decisions for the wrong reasons, for the politics around healthcare instead of the policy that you've got to focus on. So that's one thing I, I do think, and we've seen this with uh, with like the, the, the COVID situation, not that we, you know, we are in a new era of managing that pandemic. It's, it's no longer restrictions or, um, um, you know, mandates at this point. It, it's, uh, we are better protected as a result of going through that, that period. But they ran a marketing campaign telling everybody to get back out there, um, in the at the beginning of the Omicron wave, which was the most virulent wave that we uh, we had, um, that led to the highest amount of deaths ever um, in that period of time, even more than the first two years. And for the healthcare system, it overwhelmed the healthcare system. We had 800 people out uh, with COVID, staff people out. That's impacting CT scans, you know, blood work, uh, emergency departments, uh, access to primary care. That's impacting everything. Um, and the system still hasn't recovered, uh, from that, that wave. So, you know, they're, they're moving with the kind of public sentiment on, on COVID they've, re they've removed even weekly reporting on the numbers. It's monthly now, right? COVID, you know, uh, COVID moves in hours and days. It, it doesn't move in a, you know, a month is, is far too late. So like the way they've even reported COVID to the public, I think is the big, the big problem where they've removed. They've removed the information uh, so people's eyes aren't on what's happening with COVID. They don't know the impacts on life or uh, our emergency departments or, or our healthcare system. And it gives the impression that the impacts are over and that we're, we're free of, of, of COVID. And, and, and that's not true. You know, so if you, if you, if you, you know, in an Omicron wave, if you say everyone get back out there, everything's safe again, when it's not, um, that's a big, that creates a big problem. Again, we have not recovered from that. The healthcare system has not recovered from, from that wave. And if you eliminate the information, um, people, including myself, you know, like I'm, I think about it less now, uh, wear my mask less, uh, as a result of that, people are going to be less cognizant of what's actually happening. So information I think is the, is the key on, on COVID. So those are, those are two things I think that they've done that have made the situation much worse than it, than it needed to be. And on top of that, they're dealing with, with big trends in labor in the way, you know, family practices is, is, uh, is done, uh, nowadays. Um, and certainly that's all that stuff isn't their fault. Um, but, uh, they did get rid of the incentive programs to recruit docs to Halifax. So now for the first time, we've actually seen the number of people that need a doctor in Halifax shoot up uh, pretty substantially as well. So I don't know. I, I, I there, There's things that are done that, that they've done there, I think, are pretty consequential in making the healthcare system, like make, making the situation worse. There's an, they, one of the things they're doing, I think, has the great ability to have an impact. Like one of the, one of the things they're doing, which I really like and actually promoted in the leadership race, is using pharmacies more as an access point they haven't really expanded the scope of pharmacists yet but they're putting nurse practitioners they're running a pilot with nurse practitioners working in in some pharmacies to see if you know that can take some of the primary care pressure out of our emergency rooms so people can go there for you know if they have a flu the flu or need prescriptions renewed that sort of thing but um that's that that is a good move expanding and a uh, number of the other stuff they're doing is just kind of continuations of what we did expanding the virtual care program um, I was happy to see that continue forward. That can, that, that has the potential to take pressure off the emergency rooms. Um, so they're, you know, it's not a, they're, they're, they're certainly trying. Right. Um, but I just think, I think the politics of healthcare matter more to them than, than the policies around it, you know, and, um, that's not really the best way to govern. Should we make healthcare? I mean, we all realize that healthcare is an essential service. It's one of those things you just got to have no matter what, but should it be mandated? I guess maybe mandate's not the right word, but you know, for it to be like a tripartisan type involvement so that we have a collective voice in what's happening. Well, even better, I think is to give more autonomy to the, 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 the medical experts and the system experts and try to depoliticize it a little bit, right. In terms of how it's run. Um, you know, we're, it's always going to be a big political issue in public discourse because half our money's going there and, you know, governments do have to have a say in terms of how those funds are, um, 
uh, distributed, but I think there needs to be less focus on kind of the partisan involvement in healthcare and more of a focus on allowing the experts to to do their job. And that, that means elected officials even standing up to the public and saying, listen, we have to trust these folks. Um, and certainly there was an effort to do that under Stephen. That's why he, you know, the, the, the health authority board who run the operations of healthcare uh, are supposed to be, you know, somewhat independent uh, from, from the Department of Health. And the Department of Health focuses on the funding and the overarching policy, not the operations. Uh, but again, I mean, you get so much public pressure on you around healthcare and you're going to be incentivized to, to intervene politically on even operational decisions. So I, I think kind of changing the way the public looks at that system and, uh, uh, the way governments look at intervening in that system, I think would, would be, would be, would be good, you know, less partisanship when it comes to the management of healthcare and, uh, and more focus on, you know, policy development and, and, uh, and kind of thinking, you know, long-term and working in conjunction with the medical community to figure out how to tackle these big, these big issues. So locally, uh, there was an announcement a couple of years back about a new emergency room department for the Yarmouth Regional Hospital. Where, where does that stand now? And even if it's completed, will that have a positive effect on the wait times? It should. Yeah. So I was able to make that announcement when I was minister, um, that one in the, I was there for five months and two things I needed to get done there locally was the new emergency room and the, uh, uh, the cancer care expansion that we, we were able to do before we lost government. And I am pleased that that ER, uh, plan remains in place under the current government. Um, and, uh, I think we're, we should be two, two, three years out on that. So that means it's going to be bigger. Uh, hopefully have more staff, more accommodating to people, allow for more separation uh, with, with people that are sick and may be contagious as well. So it will, it will lead to a better experience for both the patient and the, and the docs and the nurses and the staff uh, as well. So th- and that, as far as we've been told so far, that project is continuing. The housing crisis continues to deepen. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk and, and some really quick fixes uh, that we've seen. But what really needs to happen in the long term, particularly for those on, you know, fixed incomes? Well, I mean, there's one of the big issues we have in Nova Scotia is there's no emergency housing stock. So if you find yourself homeless or, you know, need to get out of a tricky situation, you know, in, in some communities like Yarmouth, we, we have like Juniper House and, and some good support network, Shift House for for, for young people. Uh, who find themselves homeless, but uh, there's no provincial strategy on emergency housing. So I think that's one area where government actually does need to step in and provide some emergency housing. Um, but the big thing we need right now is is more housing stock. You know, that's what's going to kind of level out the prices. That's what's going to create, um, you know, lower rents and more opportunities for, for people to, to buy is, is having more supply. And uh, right now, there's not a great plan to increase supply. Uh, one of the ideas I've been kind of pitching, I uh, did it in the leadership, and, and uh, if, if given the chance to govern, this is something I would, I would like to do, is um, particularly on the affordable housing side, uh, there's, there's, there's grants available to developers to build fairly large-scale affordable housing units. Um, in rural Nova Scotia, there's not a lot of pickup on, on those, those, those grants because it's a higher risk, uh, real estate market, you know, historically. So I think if you're going to look at increasing housing in, in rural Nova Scotia, you've got to cut it, got to empower the full market, right? There's a lot of people that would put a tiny home on their property, either in their backyard or, or somewhere, or put a nanny suite in their basement or, you know, um, uh, you know, somewhere in in, uh, in their garage or, or something. A, a lot of people, particularly, I think, at a time when our dollar is going less, are looking for more opportunities to bring bring money into their households, would, would take the government up on grants to actually build nanny suites or affordable housing units uh, on their property. Um, so I think having incentives to do that and also working with municipalities to ensure that the bylaws don't prevent that uh, from happening uh, are, are two things that I think we need to do if we're going to get the housing stock up uh, quickly enough. Is like we really have to 
you know, unleash the market forces on this uh, and, and not just think that, you know, the big developers are going to answer, uh, be the answer to the problem in, in higher risk, l- low profit markets in, in rural Nova Scotia. You know, it's, it, it's not the same as in Halifax and Yarmouth. If you're going to, if you're going to build a big, you're not, you're not building the big multiplexes, right? So the, you know, the, the profits aren't the same. Um, and uh, Halifax is not having an issue right now. You go up there every, it, it, there's buildings going up everywhere you go. So how do we make sure that there's more housing getting into rural Nova Scotia? I think, you know, having everybody be able to uh, be a part of it if they want to be um, would be a much better, a much better strategy. Now Houston recently made a comment about doubling the provincial population um, first thing I thought of was, all right, where are they going to live? But it also cascades into the labor shortage. If you were looking to try to attract workers into the province, that's all fine and good. Doctors, lawyers, whatever, you know, professionals you want to do. Where are they going to live? Well, that yeah, that's, that's the issue, right? Um, and you've got to have housing in order to accommodate more people, you know. You also have to have uh, you know, a healthcare system that's going to be accessible and be able to accommodate those folks too, because you, it's tough to recruit people when, you know, the public narrative is that your healthcare system's in crisis. Um, so housing is fundamental uh, to growing our population, to making sure people have their basic needs met, like like shelter, and uh, we need the stock to go up pretty quickly. I think to uh, uh, make sure that there's affordable options and that uh, the people here that are already living here have access to housing and, and of course, new people that you want to recruit to the province and, and you want to immigrate here uh, are able to, to find a place to live. I had the pleasure of meeting Keith Bain a couple of times in, in the past and he struck me as a, a very nice man, a real gentleman. Of course, he is uh, the Speaker of the House, but <clears throat> there's something going on here and maybe you can help clarify it. Um, the Houston government is kind of sending out a message that maybe there's going to be a review of of uh, his position as speaker. Um, what are you hearing, and, and why is the government not being as transparent as I think it should be, in my opinion? Well, and, and also, I just I want to remind everybody uh, how sanctimonious they were. <laughs> Houston was on transparency and you know, democracy and, and, and the independence of the speaker, right? Uh, um, these were big themes for his, his election and, and, his, and during his, his term in opposition. So what's happened is Keith was pulled into the premier's office, um, told that he needed to either resign or he would be forcibly removed by confidence motion of the House. By the way, that hasn't happened since 1875. The House has not voted at a speaker since then. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I believe it's because Keith's impartial, he's fair, he treats all members of the house with a high level of respect and, and makes decisions as he should, that sometimes favor the government, but also sometimes favor opposition, uh, members. So there was, you know, he allowed in the summer session, I think two emergency debates on healthcare and on, uh, affordable affordability. Uh, that I think, you know, the premier yelled at the clerk and, and got upset in the house when, when those emergency debates were approved by the speaker. Um, but he, you know, that was, he should have approved them. They, there, there are emergency issues and, um, the house should be able to debate those. And, and he followed the criteria set out in precedent and followed the advice of his clerks who were lawyers, um, to make the right decision. And, uh, you know, I think the premier's more interested in having somebody in that seat that's going to do his bidding instead of acting in an impartial uh, way. And so this is this is like inside ball stuff. But why it should matter to people is because that that position is actually quite fundamental to our, our democratic institution in in the legislature. Like that position is responsible for ensuring that uh, things run well. That. Um, members, all members have ability to speak and present legislation and debate issues. So the speaker has control over what words are even said in there. The speaker can determine what words are parliamentary or unparliamentary. The speaker determines whether certain motions are debated on or not, like the emergency motions we had this summer on health care and, and affordability. 
Um, the speaker can rule questions in, in question period out of order. So all the authority in that chamber is in the speaker, and the tradition and convention is, is that the speaker is, is well, while a, while a card-carrying partisan uh, acts in an impartial uh, way in running, in running the, the legislature. So it, it seems like Keith is being punished for, for being impartial, and that, of course, gives me great concern. Okay, well, if that's a problem for the premier, that the speaker's dealing impartially with, with all parties— What's the agenda here? <laughs> you know what I mean? What's the uh, what's what's the game plan here? You want to be able to control the debate in there or more? You want to be able to stifle debate from from the opposition? Our role is critical to hold the government to account and point out what they're doing right, but also also where they're missing the mark and where they're not following through on their promises, right? These are kind of critical functions in our democracy. So that situation is very concerning. It's also not the way to treat somebody like Keith Bain. This guy is... Uh, Long time Tory MLA, uh, you know, has bled, sweat and bled for that for that party, um, is a really good guy, too. He's not in it for partisan politics like he's a community guy. Um, you know, he's not a fighter. He, he's 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 there to serve his people and uh, in the role of speaker to, you know, ser- serve the members of the House. And he, he does he does both of those things really, really well. And he's well respected by everybody. It sounds like he's getting crapped on for doing his job and doing it right. I mean, that's my interpretation of what's happening. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that would, that, that, I've talked to Keith. That's his interpretation too. He's on record on a CBC story of saying he's not going to resign. So it's going to have to go to a vote. And, but that's on the whole house, right? That's not just, that's not just the, the governing parties. That's everybody has to vote on that. The speaker is elected by by MLAs, all MLAs. Um, so the speaker's accountable to the whole chamber. Of course, the the conservatives have a majority. So at the end of the day, their their votes are going to de- to determine what happens with Keith. But I'm quite proud of him for standing his ground and and not being bullied out of the position. And he's not just standing up for himself. He's standing up for the chamber and for you know the kind of chamber that I know he believes in and one that's fair and one that's run impartially. Um, so, and I, and I, like, he's had health issues and I hope he doesn't mind me talking about this, but I mean, he, you know, he's had health issues. Um, he it's, admittedly is not a fighter. He doesn't like that. It stresses him out. Um, and the fact that he's willing to kind of stand up to this, this level of pressure from, uh, the premier and a, a premier that of course is of also the leader of his party, uh, I find quite impressive. And, uh, my estimation of that man has gone up and up over the years that I've known him. Um, and um, I hope he, uh, I hope he wins the day. I hope he's not kicked out and I hope he can continue to do his job because he does it admirably. So we've been talking for almost an hour, but we've got one final little piece to kind of talk about. And that's uh, the, the recent hurricane Fiona. Um, so at the height of the storm, I mean, almost half the province was without power, but it wasn't just the power. Uh, we were without communications. Some people couldn't dial 911 even if they wanted to. So in all of this, what's the government's role? What does the government need to do right now in order to motivate people like Nova Scotia Power, which is private now, and the communication sector, also private, uh, to be better prepared? I mean, this is unacceptable. It, and, and the situation's probably going to get worse in terms of extreme weather events, right? Like we, Nova Scotia uh, used to be really well protected because of the cold water around our province and, and the, the flow of the Gulf Stream that yeah, I think is, was really is impacted by the, te- the water temperature. Our waters are getting warmer, so we're going to be more subject to these sorts of uh, scary and consequential uh, weather events. So I, I, I mean, the, the role of government is, is, uh, twofold. One, get, get response in there right away. There's people's basic needs that aren't being met. Um, people are without shelter, without food. Um, and, and for a lot of low income people that, and there, there were, uh, low income neighborhoods that were impacted by this, you know, maybe without means to look after themselves. So the, the government does, I believe, have a role to support people, in these sorts of situations and particularly make sure that that basic needs are met and that that uh um 
you know, people can keep surviving until they get back up on their feet. The, the other role, of course, is to look long term at the situation and determine what needs to be done to better protect ourselves uh, now that we know that these weather events are going to be more, more common and, and, and probably more extreme. So, I mean, what they, that's done through law, you know, um, cellular and, and the power company are, are uh, regulated industries. So you work with them on the appropriate regulations to make sure that they're they're prepared um, and can take preventative measures as well. One of, one of the issues is um, trees need to be cut around power lines. You know, if we're going to prevent the power outages that we that we have, there does need to be uh, there does need to be maintenance on trees. So not everybody wants to hear that, of course, right? Because the trees are very important for our climate, uh, of course, and they're also you know, beautiful and people don't, don't want to have them cut down. But if, if we are looking at these extreme events where people can be without power for, you know, some people are still without power in the province. So this is what this is over a week, a week. Yeah. Well over a week later, uh, you know, if we want to be more preventative, you, you, they've got to be a strategy for, uh, uh, for, for maintenance around, around critical power lines, right? It's not, not all the trees around every power line, but there's some power lines that are carrying, you know, the bulk of the energy and, and those certainly need to be, uh, uh, need to be protected, and um, you also have to look at our building codes. You know, do we have do we have to start thinking about any buildings that we build now being, you know, resistant to high high winds um, for uh, development planning? You know, can, can we build on on these coastlines? Like, you know, some people, you know, either you look around here, it's usually American built properties, but you know, some of them are built right on the edge of 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 the water. Um, and you start, you have to look at the kind of, uh, flood maps and the storm surge risks and, uh, you know, help people determine whether, um, wh where to, where, where, where it's safe to build and where it's not safe to build, right. To avoid a situation like Port of Basque where literally the storm surge, you know, uh, washed homes. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, a person, uh, out into the water, you know, um, very damaging thing. So you got to, you got to have long-term planning here and uh, uh, instead of just reacting to these things as they come. Zach, if folks uh, have any questions uh, for you, uh, you know, as far as uh, uh, the constituency is concerned, maybe they need to help with uh, uh, filling out a form or, or something. Uh, I know it's very easy to get a hold of you. Tell us uh, your contact information, if you would. I've got a, I've got a very, Easy to remember phone number, 902-742-4444. So that's 742 and four fours. Um, and you'll most likely get Jacqueline uh, at our office. She is lovely. She's been my constituency assistant since day one. Um, and uh, lovely person to deal with and knows uh, everything about grants, senior property tax rebates, um, accessibility grants, home, home repair grants, all these things. And, uh, and certainly, um, I work hard to call everybody back that, that calls and, and leaves a, leaves a message for me as well. We're, we're there to help. And, um, that's a real satisfying part of the job too, is, is helping people with their issues, even though we can't, uh, we can't, we can't help everybody, but give us a call. Zach, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. And we thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your time guys. Uh, and Gary, I know I mentioned this before, man, but, uh, and, and Quinn, so happy I keep getting to do this this with you now through the through the podcast form. It's fun. It's like I like the long uh, being able to talk for longer than just you know giving people <laughs> you know, 15, 30 second sound, but it's a lot more enjoyable. So thanks for thanks for providing this venue for for people like myself to to, to use and for uh, for your listeners who are benefiting from it as well. We certainly appreciate you always saying yes when we ask. We sure every do. time. Every time. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window.